I guess this day was inevitable. So hey guys, welcome back to another video. As some of you guys might know, Microsoft announced Windows 11 a few days ago, and with it came a whole new design and the ability to tile windows and a bunch of other stuff. Even though that they're kind of late on the whole Windows tiling thing, but one of the biggest changes for me was the requirement for TPM 1.2 and secure boot enabled. So for some of you that don't know what secure boot is, it's basically a mechanism for not allowing uh, unsigned binaries from booting up the computer. So this way, stuff like viruses can't modify the kernel and then boot a modified kernel. The problem with secure boot, at least for us Linux users, is that it comes default with Microsoft keys and it doesn't come with any Linux keys. So you basically can't boot into any Linux distribution. And this is especially true for Gentoo users because we're going to be updating our kernels fairly often. So that's basically what this video is going to be about. I'm going to be going over how I got secure boot enabled on my Gentoo system. Hope you guys find this video helpful. Give it a like if you did and consider subscribing if you like this stuff. Before we get into it, I just want to give some background on stuff like MBR, GPT, Legacy BIOS, and UEFI. If you already know about this stuff, feel free to skip ahead. So right now there's basically two main partitioning tables, MBR and GPT. MBR is the old master boot record partitioning table, which is used by old Windows versions such as XP and 7. And then GPT is like the newer one that's used by Windows 8, 8.1, and 10, and most likely 11 as well. There's also two types of main booting mechanisms. We have first the legacy BIOS, which again is used by old Windows systems and then the UEFI newer system, which is used by Windows 8, Windows 10, and probably 11 as well. Now, why am I talking about these things? Well, it's mostly because if you're planning to dual boot, you're going to need to figure out what Windows supports, because Linux supports any combination of these booting methods and partitioning tables. You can do BIOS with MBR, BIOS with GPT, UEFI with MBR, UEFI with GPT. But with Windows, at least from Windows 8 to 10, Windows only supports BIOS MBR or UEFI GPT. And then so far, what we've seen with Windows 11 is that it's going to require secure boot, which probably means it's going to require UEFI. So now you're down to one option, which is UEFI with GPT. So now let's go into the architecture of secure boot. I'm not an expert on secure boot. This is just what I've read so far online. It seems that secure boot has four main variables the PK variable, the KEK variable, and the DB and DBX variable. So the PK variable is basically your master key, which is what you're going to be using to lock and unlock your secure boot kind of. The KEK is used for assigning DB and DBX. And then the DB is a list of um, binaries that your secure boot allows, and then DBX is kind of like the ones that you don't allow. So there's two modes to secure boot, and it's determined by if the PK is present or not. When it is present, then it's in user mode, where the other variables can't be modified without uh, properly signed keys and signatures. Whereas in setup mode, the PK is missing or it's not set, and this is basically where you can program in your own keys and your own signatures before finally setting the PK variable and locking it in. So basically what our process is going to be for getting secure boot to work on Linux is we're going to first set it to user mode, but with secure boot off, this will give us the default Microsoft keys so we can back them up. Then we're going to go on Linux and back up these variables and we're going to generate new keys and then combine them with the old backups to create new variables consisting of the old Microsoft keys, but also our own custom keys. And then finally, we're going to enter setup mode and then we're going to load in our variables into our secure boot and then we can turn on secure boot. So some prerequisites you would need is you, first you would need to have a UEFI BIOS working and you would need to have a UEFI kernel working as well and booted into that kernel so you can read the UEFI variables. Next we're going to need these packages, EFI tools, SB sign tools, mock utils, and open SSL. These will just help us in generating the keys and then adding it into our BIOS. I just want to give a big shout out to Sakaki for writing the guide on secure boot. Um, this video is heavily based on it and follows pretty much all the commands with the exception near the end where I have to sign my kernel and also my bootloaders. 
Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to create a directory where all of our keys are going to reside. In this case, I'm going to be following uh, Saka Keys Guide, which just has a folder called ETC EFI Keys, which is where we're going to be storing all of our keys. You can also make sure nobody can read these keys by changing the permissions of the folder. And then we're just going to read all four secure boot variables into uh, backup files. Now that we've backed up all of our files, we can create our new keys, one for the platform key, one for the key exchange key, and one for our DB key. We don't really need a DBX key because we're not going to be blacklisting anything. We can also change the permissions of these keys as well so nobody can read them. Next, we're going to convert our certificates into EFI signature lists, which is just something we need to do to add it to our secure boot. We're also going to sign our PKESL file and our KEKESL file with our PK key. And then we're going to sign our DB and DBX file with our KEK key. We'll also create DR versions of our PK, our KEK, and our DB certificate files. And then now we can combine the old Microsoft keys with our own custom keys to create a compound key which contains all of them together. And then we'll need to make sure to sign them as well with the PK key and the KEK key. Now we reboot our system and change our secure boot into setup mode and also make sure to turn secure boot off. If we boot up again and we run EFI read var, we'll see that all of our variables has no value set. And then now we can update those variables with our new keys And if we run EFI read var again, we can see now that we have a bunch of signatures in our variables. Just to make sure, we'll also back up these variables as well. And then finally, I'm going to mount my EFI partitions and sign my kernel. Before I sign my kernel, I also need to sign the bootloaders that I use. So currently I'm using the system D bootloader and it comes with two other EFI files. I'm not really sure exactly which one is the one that's doing the booting. So I'm just gonna sign both of them by first renaming them to the unsigned version and then signing them. And then finally I also sign my kernel as well. Now we can reboot our system into the BIOS. We can see now it's in user mode and we can enable secure boot and boot into our system. And now that I'm in my system, I can make sure secure boot is enabled by running the mock utils command and doing dash dash sb state. And we can see here that secure boot is enabled. So yeah, I hope you guys got your secure boot enabled and working. 
Leave a like if you found this video useful and subscribe if you want to see more like this. And I'll see you guys in the next video.